As far as the eye could see, there's no sign of life, no water, not a single green blade. Stretch out before us in all directions is an arid wasteland, a silent desert. The scorching sun reflects off crumbling rocks, burning sands, and a few scattered bones. There's not even a whisper of a breeze. And suddenly, rising up in front of us out of this vast wilderness is an enormous mountain, as lifeless and forbidding as the desert that surrounds it. Large boulders stand guard at its base. Without warning, dark clouds roll across the sky like so many artillery cannons readying for battle. Shadows cover the land. The rough, jagged shoulders of the huge peaks almost seem to become one with the menacing sky, and the desert is abruptly plunged into a dense, suffocating darkness, and the still air is almost electric. The skies are suddenly rent by blinding light and deafening sound. The entire earth begins to convulse beneath our feet as though in labor. In a flash of light, we can see the mountain shaking violently, throwing huge rocks down its heaving sides at the trembling earth. Sheets of slashing rain join the assault. No sooner has a storm started than it's over. The desert is silent again and the mountain is still. Stream begins rising, or streams begin rising from the entire valley as a spectacular rainbow arches from the valley floor right over the top of the mountain. Somehow in that brief moment, everything seems to have changed. A sense of newness fills the air. In the distance, a shining ribbon reflects in the sun. It rushes towards us. And at last moment, the river sharply turns and races past the mountain. A single bird follows the river on its serendipitous journey. The rain has cooled the desert, and the air smells surprisingly like springtime. Thousands of small dark, dark dots begin appearing on the horizons. Like the river, they seem to be slowly coming towards us. At first, it's impossible to make out what they are. But as they begin to come closer, we can see they are people. Thousands of people coming towards us from all directions. Some stop at the river to drink. Others just keep struggling forward. Those who are able to help the feeble and the small children over the rocks, they walk right past us and begin scaling the boulders at the foot of the mountains. One young man with cerebral palsy struggles with the greatest difficulty to get past the boulders and begins climbing the mountain. As he violently wretches his body up the trail, he suddenly stands erect. By the time he disappears from sight, he's, his stride seems to become more confident. The desert is flooded with people coming from every direction, all kinds of people. There's a family of Haitian refugees. That man with a machete looks like a sugarcane worker from the Philippines. The older couple over there with the threadbare clothes look like they might be from Central Europe. And those kids chasing each other must be from our inner cities in the United States. The only thing they seem to have in common is that they all look very poor. A group of three men and two women who look like they are from Central America are having particular difficulty getting started up the mountain. They are chained together at the angles, or ankles, scarcely alive. Others help, and they finally get started up the trail. They only take a few steps when they stop abruptly in the middle of the trail. They stand staring at one another, absolutely dumbfounded. Their ankle chains are lying open on the ground. A scream rings out behind them. I can see, I can see, shouts a middle-aged black man who literally throws down his cane and runs straight up the mountain. He doesn't even bother, bother to use the switchbacks. The shout brings the small group of Latin Americans back to life. They begin spontaneously singing and dancing right in the middle of the switchback, their faces transformed with jubilation. A thin Indo-Chinese Indo woman slips behind them, holding her dead emaci emaciated body close to her breast, her baby. She looks up at the startling surprise at the celebration. She seems totally incapable of comprehending this explanation of emotion. Then above the singing and shouting, an infant's cry can be heard. Good, good timing. Then above the singing and shouting, an infant's cry can be heard. Dancers immediately sense what is happening, and they sweep both mother and child in their celebration, singing and dancing. They climb the mountain together. Looking back, we can see that not only is the valley filled with people from every tongue and tribe and nation pressing toward the mountain, the valley itself has remarkably changed. Majestic cedars have appeared from nowhere. We can see small springs surrounded by uh, great big trees, beautiful trees. The desert is now convert, covered with luxurious grasslands sprinkled with wildflower, groves of olive trees with fruit clusters at the base of the mountains. Birds play in the trees. The mountain has come to life too. 
A single blade of grass has sprouted into the middle of the trail. The face is carpeted with rich vegetation and flowering shrubs. Terraced gardens of citrus and pomegranate trees line the crowded trails. Climbers help themselves to the oranges and pomegranates and the rough mountain, mountain switchback suddenly opens before us to a wide, smooth roadway. As the first climbers reach the rim of the mountain, they find themselves in a waste pla or vast plateau. And in the distance, they see a skyline of an enormous city that looks like it's descending directly out of the brilliant sky. The city glistens in the sunlight with jeweled lovely loveliness like a bride waiting for her intended. It looks like it's made of transparent gold. The jubilant crowds, arms around each other, wind their way through Edenic gardens, chanting further up and further in. The gates of the city glow like blazing pearls. They seem to lift their heads in respect as the immigrants enter. As the throng moves through the gates, there appears to be a tremendous homecoming. People begin uh, coming up different trails, run to embrace loved ones as if they haven't seen them for a long time. Sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, mom and dads, grandparents act as if they're home at last. And the best of all, that seem, seems like everything's come to life again. The past, the present, and the future have become one. A thousand voices in a hundred different tongues sing an incredibly lovely song. In one street, some spontaneous folk dancing begins. Jews and Arabs, Afrikanders and Angolians, Protestants and Catholics from Northern Ireland, and people from every political, ethnic, cultural background are dancing up one street and down the other, embracing, caught up in the spirit of the mountain of the city. Even wild and domesticated animals join in the celebration. I don't know where they come from, but no one seems to be afraid. A small curly-headed child rides by the dancers on a lion. It's like a circus, a family reunion, and a meeting of the United Nations all at the same time. The dancing columns sing at the top of their voices, follows the lion and child, they enter the city. A small group stops dancing and starts dismantling some military weaponry found outside the city. It looks like they are trying to fashion some missile casings into pipes to construct an irrigation system for raising water uh, from the valley below. The boy and the lion leads the celebrants into a huge square into the center of the city. Every tree in the vast square is decorated with lavish garlands of flowers welcoming the guests. Beds and spring blossoms raise their heads and join the chorus of welcome. The atmosphere is square, uh, in the square hangs heavy with the fragrance of springtime and a growing sense of anticipation. And underneath the trees are hundreds of long oak tables beautifully decorated with fruit and flowers. They are covered with large jugs of wine and plates stacked high with bread. The entire square looks like a gigantic wedding reception. A solitary figure puts down a shepherd's staff, picks up a towel, and prepares to serve the guests. People begin filling the square. As they enter, their jaws invariably drop in wonder at the stunning beauty and the gracious hospitality. But the singing only stops for a moment. Part of the procession is still following the boy on the lion toward the head of the square. There at the very center of the city, a serene crystal river flows from a brilliant light which illuminates the entire city. Somehow the mountain, the city, and the river are all one. As the procession approaches, we see a small group of people having enthusiastic foot races along the river. A line of crutches and canes mark their track. An elderly American couple sit down on a bench in the sun in front of the temple and watch a group of kids from England and Ireland playing together. Everywhere you can hear those who have been in prison rejoicing. They keep shouting over and over again, all oppression is ended, all sins are forgiven. Following the child, they crowd along the riverbank to give grateful thanks. Some are still singing, others are quietly praying, still others with famous or faces almost on fire with joy extend their hands toward the heavens with praise. The singing and the praising and the laughing and the crying all blend into beautiful harmony. And over a period of what seems to be hours, thousands come to the river, kneel down to pray, and go away renewed. In the square, a child's voice suddenly rings out above the happy sounds. Proclaim the feast of the Lord. And people begin moving toward the tables. The poor, the oppressed, the forgotten ones are made the special guest of honor. Quietness settles in the entire assembly. The child speaks again with great reverence. Here on Mount Zion, the Lord Almighty will prepare a banquet for all nations of the world, a banquet of the richest foods and finest wines. Here he will suddenly remove the cloud of sorrow that has been hanging over all nations. The sovereign Lord will destroy death forever. Now at last God has his dwelling among men, he says. He will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them. And he will wipe every tie from, or tear from their eyes. There shall be an end to death and no more mourning and crying and pain. For the old order has passed away. 
And then he sat on the throne and said, Behold, I am making all things new. Pretty cool vision of heaven and the last day. It's written by Thomas Sine. It's one of the most books that influenced my life back in the early 80s. And he wrote that chapter. I remember reading that chapter and just feeling how wonderful and beautiful that was and all the people that will be there with us. Now, I don't know if that's all that's going to exactly happen, but that's some of the descriptions that we read about in the Bible. But it captures your attention about that day and how we should long for that day. What would it be like? We talked about 11 different or nine, let's say eight. Let's see, I got 20 of them. Nine different things last week about what heaven will be like. This is a beautiful description of that. We have a few more to add to that today as we begin to conclude this series. So what will it be like? Number 12, <laughs> building off of last week, we will see our friends and family there. A woman suddenly passed, suddenly passed away, and all of a sudden she appears before the pearly gates. Boom! And there was Peter sitting at the desk. And she goes, where is this heaven? He goes, yes, it is, ma'am. Yes, it is. Welcome to heaven. She goes, oh, this is awesome. She says, what do I need to get in? He says, it's really simple. You just need to spell the word love. She goes, oh, that's awesome. Uh, L-O-V-E, welcome to heaven. She, he says, I'm so glad that you made it. You're going to love it up here. And so they talk for a little bit. And Peter says, tell you what, you know, I need to go run and do an errand. I need to talk to the angel Gabriel for a minute. Can you watch the desk while I'm gone? I'll be right back. Don't worry. You know how it all works. You just tell them that they need to spell love and boom, everything's taken care of. And she says, I know I'm kind of nervous about that, but I, I guess I can do that. So he takes off, and she's sitting there for a while, and luckily no one came. All of a sudden, boom, there was her ex-husband, and he was not a very nice man. And she goes, what are you doing here? And he's going, what is this place? This is really awesome, gnarly. And she, and she goes, and Lois, what are you doing here? I said, this is heaven. How did you get in here? She said, I don't know, but this is going to be awesome. And she's just dejected, and she does, I can't believe this. And he goes, what do I got to do to get in? She goes, Cal, you, gotta, you just got to spell a word. He goes, that's it? Yep. Well, what's the word? And she goes, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> oh, that's not how we get in. But we will see our loved ones there. We will see our friends there. There are going to be a lot of people in heaven all over the world, from all over the world, every generation since the beginning and time of earth. In Revelation 7, verse 9, it says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe and nation and people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. There was such a great multitude, it says, that no one can count from every tribe and nation and people and language standing before the Lord. Now, that's a great. It's going to be people from all different backgrounds that had served the Lord and followed him. Our loved ones who follow Jesus will be there as well. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 through 18, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with them forever, with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Not everyone we know will be in heaven, only those, it says, that are in Christ, those that followed Christ and surrendered to his lordship during this world as we lived here. But our loved ones that did that and our friends that did that, we will be able to see them. And we will be able to recognize them. We will know who they are. In, in Luke chapter 9, there's a little story there. And, and uh, Luke 9, verse 29 through 33 and Jesus went up to a mountain. He was praying. And it says, as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. And it says, two men showed up, Moses and Elijah, and they peered in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. And they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. And Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing by him. As, as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to the master, is it good for us to be here? Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So an exciting moment for, can you imagine waking up to that and seeing that? But the point of this is they recognized them. 
They knew who they, they never seen, they didn't have pictures of Moses and Elijah on their walls, but they were able to recognize them, who they were. You'll be able to recognize people. <clears throat> Moses was one of the most influential leaders, and Elijah were some of the most influential leaders in the Old Testament of the Bible, and they've been dead for a long time. But these disciples knew who they were. And perhaps it's a clue what heaven will be like. We will recognize and know people, and especially our loved ones. Now, we don't know what they're going to look like. Uh, some think that they'll look like they're in the prime of their life, but we'll recognize them. Um, you'll see me with hair, or otherwise you won't have any hair. Maybe heaven, everybody's bald, right? And so you're the ones that have been cursed all your life. <laughs> but you'll be able to recognize me with my long, flowing, blonde hair running through the woods. <laughs> But you'll see each other and you'll meet each other. I picture, I picture my grandparents sitting under a tree in those old iron outdoor chairs. And, and there they are. Oh, here comes the kids. Just like they would do on the farm or in town. Somebody asked, what about babies? And especially, what about babies that die inside the womb? Will we know them? In 2 Samuel 12, verse 23, it says, Now that he is dead, this is King David talking, now that his little boy is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? And then he says, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. That was one of the first re mentions of resurrection, or at least an afterlife in the Old Testament of the Bible, that David would see his young boy once again. He seems to suggest that he won't see him in this present life because he will pass away, or he did pass away, but he will recognize him in the next. One of our good friends, her mother was passing away, and she had two miscarriages during her life. And right before she passed away, she got really excited. She says, I see the kids. I see the kids. And then she died. There's life in the womb. We have to protect that. They're human beings. And you will see them again in heaven. A near-death experience I was reading about, there was a lady, older lady, that was in a coma for, in a, with an illness for weeks. And one of her best friends had passed away during that time period, so she didn't know that she had passed away. And uh, right before this lady died, uh, she woke up, and she says, oh, I see my mom, and I see my dad. And then she says, Elma, what are you doing here? And then she closed her eyes and died. You'll see people and recognize them in heaven. One 92-year-old lady quipped, I hope I die soon or my friends are going to think that I didn't make it. <laughs> Number 13, our marriage relationship will change there. This is kind of an interesting one. Some Sadducees, they were kind of, I don't know, they were religious people, but they're kind of, I don't know how, you know, liberal and conservative those terms change, and, but they were more pro-Rome, and they, were, they, they didn't follow the Old Testament teachings quite like the Pharisees, which are very conservative and very strict adherers to the, to the law. So the Sadducees, and they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were challenging Jesus. They told the story about a man being married, and then uh, the, the husband dies, and then she marries again, and the husband dies about seven times, and then they ask, who's going to be, who's she going to be married to in heaven? And Jesus says this in Matthew twenty two thirty. 30. It says, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. So when I first read that, I thought, well, what do you mean we're not going to be married? And it kind of got sad. I was thinking like, I mean, we're not going to, Carrie and I aren't going to hang out? And... Um, you know, at death, contracts are broken. Contra not broken, but they end. The covenant ends. So I'm going, to, that's really sad. Now she's probably thinking, finally, I get rid of the dope. I can move on. But I started looking into that a little bit, and I looked at some scholarships, or people, different scholars, and I was thinking about this. And I was a little confused about it. You know, when you think about the original Garden of Eden, that's kind of what heaven is supposed to be like. God created Adam first, and then he realized that there was something missing. In Genesis 2 verse, 1, eight, uh, 2, verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone, and I'll make a suitable helper for him. So he created Eve, and a partnership was formed to have children and rule the earth together. That was the commission. And the Lord says, This is very, very good. So for those that say God is all we need, then why did the Lord create a partner in paradise for each other? Well, he created us relational beings. And he knew that we would need people in our life, not only husbands and wives, but people in our life. And so he created humans for relationships with each other. 
Even the great commandment says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are relationship terms about how we are to treat people. Also, marriage isn't part of the curse. Marriage happened before the curse in Genesis 3. Marriage happens in Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis 2. And so some think, <laughs> some think marriage is a curse, but it wasn't part of the original curse. So here's the second passage that caught my eye, Isaiah 65, 23. It says, they will not toil in vain or bear children. This is a vision of what heaven will be like. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. So if it's literal, is the Lord just simply telling us that there's no pain and hardship? Is he talking about marriage there as well? Well, Scott McKnight, who's a modern-day modern scholar, a very good scholar, he wrote a book on heaven called the, the uh, Heaven's Promise. And he writes this about it. He thinks he's got it figured out, and I like how he's figured it out. He says this. Here's my boldest and most complex claim. What Jesus said was not that there won't be marital life in heaven. He could have said that quite easily, making the statement straight out, but he didn't say that. He could have said, in heaven there will be no marriages and families. Instead, he said, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. That statement by Jesus does not say people who are now married won't remain in a married state in heaven. It just simply says there will be no more new marriages in heaven. Again, neither does it speak of a word about sex or procreation or pleasure. This text only says that there's not going to be any new marriages in heaven. I have to quote his words and set them off so that they'll stand out. He, this, he's talking about Jesus here. So these are all, this is directly from his book. They will neither marry nor be given in marriage. The first part, will, they will neither marry, is a reference to a groom who marries. And then the second term, be given in marriage, points to the bride being given away in marriage. So as you look at it again, the text does not say no families or no marriages. It says there will be no weddings and no, and no new marriages in heaven. Why? Because it says they're going to be like the angels. Well, what does that mean? Well, the traditional view says that angels don't have a gender. It will be like the angels. Therefore, there will be no more marriages or families in heaven. And that's an interesting view. But again, the text doesn't actually say that. The best way to look at it, it says to look in three different places to decide what that means. What does it mean to be like the angels? So he quotes, this isn't in our notes here, but he quotes Mark 12, 25. They will be like the angels. This is the three times that it shows up in the Bible prior to this. In Matthew 22, 30, they will be like the angels of heaven. But then Luke, in his gospel, or his story about Jesus, he clarifies what that means. They can no longer die, for they are like the angels. So it's about not dying. It's not, not being gender neutral. It's about not dying in heaven. That's a big difference. So Jesus was saying the major reason is to procreate in order to carry out... Whoops, i got to make sure... Yep. Um, the major reason is to procreate in order to continue one seed or heritage. That's one of the reasons why God created marriage. And when Jewish, when you look at Jewish culture, and that was a big deal to have an heir because that would carry on the family's line. And that would say that their family would live on for infamy because there would be another heir, another family, another heir. So there would be wagers. And believe me, we got a lot of wagers coming down the pipe. I don't know how many we got. Wagers everywhere uh, from our family tree. Um, but you don't need that in heaven anymore because you never die. You don't have to keep your name going on and on and on because your name will always live forever. So there's really no reason necessarily to have children to carry on your line because you'll never you'll be like the angels. So that's why you don't have marriages in heaven. That's what he says. And I like that. I like that better than saying, see you later. Thanks for, see this year, 30 years. Thanks for 30 years, Carrie. It's been a, it's been a good ride but we'll be able to spend eternity with each other. Number 14, but it will be different, I should say, and the relationship will be different. How? We don't know exactly, but we'll have our loved ones around us. Number 14, there's going to be rewards in heaven for those who are faithful. We're, now, we're not saved by our works. We will be rewarded for our works and the things that we did in response to Jesus. We're not saved by them, but it's a way that we prove that we are saved. Matthew 16, verse 27, it says, For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. God will honor outstanding people like the Apostle Paul for what they did on earth and those who died as martyrs for Christ. God will also honor those that minister to the poor and the poorly. Matthew, or in, in uh, Matthew's history of Jesus... 
he writes this very interesting, uh, records an interesting statement from Jesus. Jesus is talking about the end and how God's going to judge people. And he says in Matthew 25, 34 through 36, the king will say, God will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, uh, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. That's, we get rewarded for that. That's why our church does the very things that we do. Because of that very passage. Not because we're going to get patted on the back. It's because Jesus loves people and he loves people that don't have a lot the most, in a sense. And he wants them to have a chance. And so if we serve those people and love those people, we will be rewarded for that. There'll be other rewards as well. We don't have, we could spend a whole sermon just on rewards. Number 15, we will continue to learn in heaven. Ephesians 2, verse 6 through 7, it says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us in heaven, in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I highlighted that word, show. He's going to show us these unbelievable riches. We're going to learn, and we're going to understand, and we're going to be able to say, oh, that's how you did that. That's how that worked. Oh, now it makes sense, but we'll get to learn. Number 16, we will have our own place to live in heaven. John 14, verse 2 through 3, Jesus talking to his disciples before he's going to be uh, arrested and, and then eventually crucified. So they were kind of nervous about that. And he's trying to reassure them. He says, my father's house has many rooms. For not so, I would, have, would I not have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Now, there's a single place called the Father's house, which is eternal in heaven. And then it's, there's plural places, rooms. It says there's going to be rooms, which are the dwellings of God's people. So basically, Jesus is saying that heaven, there's going to be a lot of rooms, and we'll be able to reside in heaven with our Lord the Old Testament vision of heaven says in Isaiah 65, 21, they will build houses and dwell in them. It goes on to say that they won't be taken away like invaders would come and take over. But it is this idea that you're going to have your place, your own place, and you'll be able to dwell there. Mine's going to be on the lake, steam rising off, loons calling in the morning, fish jumping. We don't need to eat fish anymore probably, uh, but, um, but that's my vision. <laughs> a beautiful lake, Minnesota lake, and go down and drink the water. And um, you have different visions as well. Different place. We will have a place to dwell. Number 17, there will be eating and drinking there. Isaiah 25, 6, on the mountain of the Lord, Almighty, you prepare a feast with rich foods for all peoples, the best of meats and the finest of wines. Isaiah 65, it says they will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. In Revelation 19, blessed are those invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. A lot of food up there. I like that. Revelation 2, to him who overcomes, I give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Lots of eating, and yet it won't get fat. <laughs> that would be even better. Because you have glorified bodies. But it, it's taste. You know, there's, there's pleasure in taste. And so I like spicy foods or, or curry or Thai foods or salt, and, salt on a steak or whatever. But you'll have those senses. We'll be able to eat. Number 18, animals will be there. Part of this is a vision of peace between people that were at odds with each other. But part of it is, if they're not going to be there, then why use them as an example? Isaiah eleven six: the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf, and the lion, and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them all. Just like Tom Sine wrote in that little essay. So there'll be animals, and you won't have to be afraid of them, and you get to wrestle with lions. And they'll lick you <laughs> instead of bite your head off. Isaiah 65, 25, the wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like an ox. We had a Dr. Shim, Shim, we call him Dr. Shim because they can never pronounce it. Awesome man, Christian man. He was our vet. Not too far away. He retired many years ago. But when we had to put our animals down, um, we would go in and he would pray. We'd circle the little animal, the cat, and cat, a couple cats, 
He says, let's, let's pray for Kirby. And Kirby was one of my... Not, we didn't put Kirby down. He passed away. Um, Taco was one that we had to put down. Taco, we found at a Taco Bell. So what do you call him? Taco. It was a crazy cat. And she had to be put down. So he said, let's pray. And he said, God, I thank you for animals. And I thank you for the pleasure they bring us in the camaraderie and the good times. And when we cry, we can, you know, he just goes on. It's a beautiful prayer. And we're so grateful to be able to see them again in heaven. Thank you, God. We pray now you watch over Taco. Amen. It's really quite moving. And the little kids were kind of put at ease. And then we left the room and said goodbye. But we'll see Taco again. And hopefully he will be sane because he was crazy cat. <laughs> he should be sane. Well, there will be animals there. And we don't know exactly how that looked, but there will be animals there. Number 19, there will be joy and laughter. Isaiah 35, 10, his vision said, or prophecy said, those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion singing. Everlasting joy will crown their head. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sign will flee. You know what, it just what a great, how fun it is just to, uh, we were laughing, we were, Carrie found a book and uh, my sister-in-law, Kathy, would get our kids together and then she put a little book together for our um, as Father's Day and Mother's Day. And uh, it was just, Carrie found it as we were cleaning our house for graduation and weddings. And so she was reading and she just starts bursting out laughing. And so they would ask kids. It's actually a really great practice to do with your kids. Um, but the, they would, Kathy would just ask questions. So how do you know, what, do, what, is your, <laughs> what does your mom do when she, what does your dad do when he's really happy? He claps really loud and says, yippee! <laughs> that was one of the things. <laughs> and uh, one of them, I can't remember, it was Brandon. What does your mom do when she's mad? She goes over and smacks us. <laughs> she's never, <laughs> ever done that. <laughs> and then what, is your, what does mom do when she's happy? She goes and smacks Carson or something like that. <laughs> You're going like, what? We just started laughing. Oh, it was funny. Uh, one of the ones Brandon said was, uh, what does your dad do when he, no, uh, one of them said, what does your dad do when he gets really mad? He gets really quiet or something like that. How do you know, how do you know that your dad is happy? And he goes, he's had his pills. That's what he wrote. <laughs> oh, we were laughing so hard at that. And it was so cute. I had anxiety back then, and I'm sure that's, I probably said, these are my happy pills. <laughs> so I'm not on any other pills. I don't, I'm not on any right now. But, but um, it was really, that laughing, the, the point is that laughing feels so good. There's going to be joy in heaven. And those endorphins that we have right now, you know, that's, we're just going to feel so overwhelmingly joy, like a good laugh. And number 20, we will continually thank God for heaven. In Revelation 7, 10 through 11, and they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God. We're going to be so grateful, and we're going to thank God. He's going to be present with us. We're going to have that intimate relationship with him, but we're going to continually thank him. That's what worship is. Thank is worship is not... Just coming and singing songs, it's an expression of our gratitude to God. That's why we should sing them with as much vigor as we can, because it's an expression of our gratitude. And we'll do that. And we'll do that continue. It's not like we continually sing. I'm sure there'll be festivals that we come and just praise God for all the things that he's done. And it's going to be people from all over the world. One of my favorite uh, singers are African singers and their harmonies when they sing together. And I'll listen to that on YouTube sometime. But all the nations will come together with all their music and will praise God. Now, isn't that, doesn't that sound like a good place to go? We don't have to fear it. God's got an unbelievable place. We try to describe it, and these are little samples of what it'd be. But you, it's going to be a great place, and we don't have to fear it. We don't have to fear it. In fact, Paul, as he's writing to a church in Colossae, he says, you know what? You, you guys are saved now. Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. What should you do from this point on? And he says this, since you have been raised to life, 
new life with Christ, what should you do? Go around belly aching about all the stuff that you don't have? He says, no, set your mind on things above. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things on this earth. For you died to this life. And your real life is hidden in Christ, in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. Keep your mind focused. Set your mind on things above, not on things below. For you died, and now your life is hidden in Christ. That's where our joy, that's where our hope comes from. So think about heaven. Think about heaven often. That's the big bottom line that I want you to understand. Think about heaven often. Jesus is preparing a place for us. He knows what he is doing. He is the son of a carpenter. He is also the son of the creator. It's going to be outstanding. Don't miss out on heaven. Don't miss it for the world. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to get a glimpse of what heaven is like through the prophets and through the New Testament writers, through the vision that you gave to uh, the Apostle John. And I know, Lord, and probably messed up some of it, but at least it gives us a glimpse of what it's going to be. It's just going to be fantastic. And when we have Christ in our life, Lord, and I'm so grateful for that, we don't have to fear what happens in this life, no matter what comes our way, because we know, we know that there, you've built a place for us, a room for us, a place where we can dwell with you forever and there's no more crying or pain and we get to see our loved ones again that followed you. How exciting that will be. Help us have that sense of excitement and live with that sense of excitement every day of our life. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you for being here today. Hope you have a blessed day next week. I was going to talk about hell. I still might, but it's Father's Day, so I don't want that to be a, a bummer. <laughs> but you got to know about that as well. But anyway, come back next week. Uh, it will be great to be in the presence of God and think about heaven. It's a great place. God bless you.